Immunolabeling with Visicol Histo, Principles and Practical Considerations. Immunolabeling is a powerful tool used to identify the location and identity of proteins, receptors, and cells within tissue. Immunolabeling techniques are most commonly used on tissue sections and in Western blotting. Combined with tissue clearing, immunolabeling provides the ability to interrogate the structure of tissues in three dimensions. What is immunolabeling? Immunolabeling takes advantage of antibodies raised specifically to bind to a target antigen. Antibodies bind very, very tightly to the target in the tissue, and coupling with a fluorescent molecule allows you to localize the antibody to in particular cells. This is used for many purposes, to identify particular types of cells and proteins, to monitor cellular events such as apoptosis or necrosis, to localize proteins, receptors, biomolecules, and cells within tissue, and to determine the extent of protein expression. In this slide, you see the structure of IgG antibodies. You can see here we have a variable region, an antigen binding site, as well as the constant region, which is the same for all IgG molecules. Immunolabeling for clear tissue, an overview. Immunolabeling requires five steps, fixation of tissue, antigen retrieval, blocking, labeling, and clearing. Fixation. Paraformaldehyde is preferable for fixation, but 10% neutral buffered formalin is acceptable. Transcardial perfusion is recommended for all tissues thicker than five millimeters. Tissues thicker than five millimeters where perfusion is not available should be bread loafed for immersion fixing, wherein you cut channels into the tissue to allow the fixative to penetrate to the center. Overfixation of tissues can lead to poor antibody labeling due to blocking access of epitope sites to antibodies. The ideal fixation technique involves fixing tissues for 24 hours at 4 degrees C, then one hour at room temperature, followed by transfer to PBS with 0.05% sodium azide as, as a preservative. Methanol, hope fixative, and histochoice are even better for immunolabeling. You should follow the manufacturer's protocol for these techniques. Antigen retrieval. The antigen retrieval process is a vital step in the immunolabeling of whole tissues. It is a chemical pretreatment process that involves dehydration, washing with DMSO, and rehydration. This increases the access of antibodies to the antigens in the tissue by opening pores in tissue membranes without removing the membranes. This, of course, increases the permeability of tissues to antibodies and drastically improves results. Without antigen retrieval, staining is limited to approximately 50 microns deep. Some denser tissues may require additional treatment with the permeabilization buffer, included with the Visicol Histo kit. Blocking and labeling. Blocking refers to incubation with an arbitrary protein to block nonspecific binding of antibodies. Typically, we use donkey or bovine serum albumin. This is not typically required for monoclonal antibodies. Labeling, of course, is the most critical step for success in 3D imaging. The incubation time, as well as the concentration of the antibody, are the most important variables to optimize for your results. There are a number of factors that affect immunolabeling, including the choice of your antibody, the concentration of the antibody, the thickness of the tissue, the incubation time, as well as the tissue's porosity. Choice of antibody. Not all antibodies are created equal. You must choose antibodies that have been validated for immunohistochemical applications. Different antibodies can be reared using different antigens, which means that some antibodies are reared using the, the whole molecule of the antigen, whereas some are reared just on peptide sequences or a fragment of that molecule, and of course can yield different results. Monoclonal versus polyclonal antibodies. With monoclonal antibodies, you'll get less background, but potentially less signal. With polyclonal antibodies, there's possibly higher background, but you get a much brighter signal. Some commercial antibodies do not work in 3D IHC. For example, with GFAP, we obtain no signal with the Sigma Aldrich Rabbit IgG anti-GFAP. However, we obtained excellent stating with the Encore Bio Chicken IgY anti-GFAP. Screen your antibody on a small piece of tissue prior to large sections to ensure that it's compatible with 3D IHC. Antibody concentration. The most critical factor for achieving success with immunolabeling is the antibody concentration. Typically, good results are obtained using 1 to 50 to 1 to 250 dilution for primary antibodies that come in a 1 mg per mil stock solution. There are two problems caused from using too high of concentration with antibodies. The antibodies bind at a high rate, blocking channels in the outer layers of tissue, which prevents further antibody penetration. This causes a ring of intense staining at surface layers. Intense labeling at the surface causes 
too many photons to be absorbed during imaging to get a good signal deeper into tissue. And this is optical attenuation due to Beer's law. Too low of concentration, of course, and not enough antibody will be available to get to the center of the tissue so the signal drops off. Concentration should be optimized for each antibody and tissue. Here's a diagram that shows the issues with a concentration that is too high for your tissue. As you can see here, after incubation, with the optimum concentration, antibodies are penetrating and labeling evenly. But on the right side, where the concentration is too high, we see significant binding of the antibody blocking antibody from being able to diffuse deep into the tissue. Finally, at equilibrium, with the optimum concentration, we get even staining along the z-axis. With a, with a concentration that is too high, we obtain uneven staining as a large amount of antibody is stuck in the upper layers of the tissue. How to optimize antibody concentration? Cut five 100 to 500 micron sections of the tissue of interest. Process tissues through antigen retrieval steps. Block tissues and blocking buffer. Incubate tissues with varying concentrations of antibody. 1 to 50 to 1 to 500 should be used for 1 mg per mil antibody stock solution. Examine tissues with an epifluorescent microscope for specificity and intensity of staining. Examine tissues using a confocal microscope on the XZ plane to determine the level of intensity according to depth. Incubation time and tissue thickness. Tissue thickness directly affects antibody incubation time. As a general rule of thumb, incubation time increases three times for doubling of tissue thickness. Experiment to half a mil to one millimeter thick pieces to identify incubation time prior to scaling up to whole tissues. Scale up using the general rule. You can always incubate tissues longer in antibody solutions if you're not sure of the proper time. Tissue porosity. Antibody permeability is lowered in denser tissues. Connective tissues, collagenous tissues, and tissues meant to compartmentalize fluid, such as the liver and the kidney and some lymphatic tissues, often present problems when doing immunolabeling. Overfixed tissues and archived formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues also have this problem. The easiest tissues to stain are brain, nerves, muscle, lung, placenta, mammary, adipose tissue have plenty of surface access to the inner layers. The most difficult tissues to label are the intestine, liver, kidney, and lymph node. You can improve penetration in difficult tissues using the permeabilization buffer included in the Visicol Histo Kit, also available at our website, visicol.com. Direct versus indirect labeling. Direct labeling involves an antibody conjugated directly to a fluorescent marker. There is no amplification of the signal, so sometimes the signal is not sufficient in larger tissues. Direct labeling, of course, is faster since it only requires incubation with the primary antibody. Indirect labeling is slightly more laborious, but in, allows for an amplification of the signal obtained. The indirect labeling involves labeling with the primary antibody, followed by labeling the primary with a secondary antibody which is conjugated to the fluorescent marker. The signal becomes amplified since more than one antibody can bind per target. This method is slower because it requires two incubations with antibodies. Autofluorescence. Many endogenous pigments present in tissues have intrinsic fluorescence. Autofluorescence can increase due to overfixation and incubation of samples at elevated temperatures. Perfusion of tissues removes blood which contains major sources of autofluorescence and is recommended for larger tissues. Autofluorescence can be mitigated by subtraction of image by a channel devoted to the autofluorescence channel. Please see our autofluorescence tutorial for more information. Multicolor labeling. Up to four targets can be labeled simultaneously using immunolabeling, taking advantage of the blue, green, red, and far red channel. Confocal microscopes with tunable filters can often image more than four colors simultaneously. You must choose primary and secondary antibodies carefully for multicolor labeling. Antibodies require a different host species for each target. An example is given below for two targets, GFAP and new N. Primaries can be incubated simultaneously, and the secondary antibodies can also be incubated simultaneously to one another. Here's an example of results obtained from immunolabeling a rat brain. In this image, the green shows nuclei and the red shows cells labeled with GFAP. Here we see the rat brain hippocampus. Troubleshooting. What do you do when you get uneven staining? If your antibody concentration is too high, a ring of intense staining near the surface 
can be seen, followed by a significant drop-off in the intensity towards the inner parts of the tissue. The solution is to reduce the antibody concentration. If the signal is still too weak, incubate in half the concentration for half the time, and then transfer to a higher concentration for the remaining time to avoid antibody getting held up in the outer layers. If your antibody concentration is too low, you will see the signal drop off gradually towards the middle of the tissue. The solution is to increase your antibody concentration and or incubation time. Uneven staining can also be due to optical attenuation. Optical attenuation due to absorption of photons at the upper layers causes a shadowing for tissues below, even with perfectly even staining. The way to get around this is to increase the laser power and gain as depth increases. You want to compare your immunolabeling to your nuclear stain intensity, since nuclear stain diffuses very fast into tissue. The Leica SP5 and SP8 can automate the process of compensation as depth increases. What do you do if you see no signal? If you've used direct labeling, direct labeling sometimes did not give bright enough signal for three-dimensional labeling. If so, you should use indirect labeling with a conjugated secondary antibody to amplify the signal. If you've used indirect labeling, you should try a, a different vendor's antibody. Some antigens are disrupted through fixation, antigen retrieval and the clearing process, and are not compatible with Visicol Histo. Please see our website for a list of antibodies that have been validated with Visicol Histo. If you see no signal and you're working with tissues that have been stored in formalin or FFPE tissues, the problem is likely due to prolonged fixation. Prolonged fixation can greatly reduce tissue permeability and will often yield tissues that are inaccessible to antibody labeling. The solution to this problem is to extend treatment with the permeabilization buffer as well as the antigen retrieval steps. A more drastic solution is to obtain proteinase K or trypsin to digest the proteins which can improve the penetration of antibodies to the deeper layer. What do you do if your tissue hasn't cleared? Visicol Histo 2 is not compatible with polystyrene and will extract plastic polymer into the tissue resulting in opacity. So be sure to use only polypropylene or glass containers for the storage of Visicol Histo 2 samples. Incomplete dehydration can also lead to cloudiness in tissues when they're transferred to Visicol Histo 1 and 2 due to refractive index mismatch between the water and the Visicol Histo solutions. You should use 10 to 20x the volume of the tissue for dehydration solutions. You should also increase the incubation time for dehydration steps prior to clearing and be sure to use fresh dehydration solution as methanol or t-butanol tend to soak up water over time. Tissues dense with connective biomolecules such as collagenous tissues like the liver and kidney fail to clear due to incomplete penetration of dehydration and clearing agents. You should incubate these tissues with the permeabilization buffer included in the Visicol Histo starter kit overnight prior to antigen retrieval steps. Another option is to increase the incubation time in dehydration solutions prior to clearing. We recommend for more information taking a look at our Getting Started Guide, the Visicol Histo booklet, the tutorials on our website, as well as the list of validated antibodies available also on our website. Be sure also to use the protocol builder to help you choose the perfect parameters for your specific application to receive the best results using Visicol Histo. Thanks so much for learning more about tissue clearing.